Um, my name is Hamid Alizadeh. I work for the editorial board of Marxist.com, which is a website of an international organization called International Marxist Tendency. So you kind of know where I stand. Um, now, if you read the mass established mass media today, over the past few months, you will get this idea that there is a wave of rabid, barbaric, hysterical refugees who are storming the, uh, the, the gates of Europe in order to steal our money and our benefits and basically our civil, civilized existence. That's the kind of idea that, that comes across to you. Uh, and it's just a never-ending wave. But the reality is, I mean, just to set down some facts, is that over the past two months, 200,000 people have come, uh, have tried to uh, get into uh, to the EU which is compared to the 500 million people who lives in the EU is actually nothing. There's absolutely nothing in terms of economy, in terms of integrating these people into the European population would be absolutely no problem if there was a general plan uh, for, uh, and a, an honest plan for, for, for doing this. The EU economy is after all the biggest economy on, uh, on the planet. In the, in the UK, they say you know, there's ever rising waves of refugees and so on. But in fact, since 2011, the, the amount of refugees coming to the UK has halved. And last year, only 10,000 people were granted refugee status in the UK, while 90% of, of uh, asylum seekers were uh, rejected. Um, in fact, the majority of refugees, uh, uh, you know, of, the, of the ones who are coming towards Europe now, uh, who are coming from the Middle East, the majority of the refugees from the Middle East are, is still in the Middle East. You have in Turkey, 2 million people. In Lebanon, you have 1.2 million people. In Jordan, you have a million people. And inside Syria, which is the biggest source of refugees, you still have 7 to 9 million people being uh, refugees. Uh, so it's, in fact, it's, it's, it's nothing compared to the amount of refugees that are there and also the size of the EU economy. And the fact you know, to say that, oh, we can't afford this is, 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 a, is, a, is a blatant lie by the ruling class of Europe to say it. Honestly, uh, and it really re reveals the essence of the establishment. We always go on and talk about democracy and values and civilization and humanity. But when it really comes to people who are in need, they, have, they are ab absolutely scrupulous uh, and don't care. Now, one question, which is the first one you would ask, is why would so many people risk everything, losing their families, uh, giving up their lives, giving up their friends, giving up the whole social uh, uh, environment that they've built up, that they know, that they understand, to come uh, to come to Europe. This uh, Alain Cordy, who was almost perversely portrayed on the front pages of all the newspapers in Europe, this three-year-old kid who, who, who washed up on the shores of, of, uh, of, of Turkey, he also lost his older brother, who was five, and his mother, who was, who was uh, 35. And what did the media do? They blamed his dad as claiming that he was a people smuggler, that he was just a scrupulous people. That's really the, the evil people who are there. Uh, but why would someone do that? Why would, in fact, because that's not the only family. Hundreds, thousands of families have been destroyed like that. Thousands of people have died this year alone. 3,000 people have died just by crossing with the boats. Hundreds of people have died by walking hundreds and thousands of miles. Uh, and human lives have been, have, have, have been lost not to come up and, uh, and get benefits from the UK. In fact, I think I'd rather risk my life than to go to the benefits office because it's a horrible experience, as, as many people would know. Uh, it's because of the extreme desperate situation which is there. But that was just the first question we should ask ourselves because the real question is, why is, that, is there such a question in the Middle East? Why is there such a question everywhere in, in basically in the less developed parts of the, of the world? Uh, that you have such a waves of uh, uh, such a big wave of refugees and migrants uh, uh, developing. And you see, it's not because Middle Eastern people, or Arab people. That's kind of the kind of the hint you get when you when you watch mass media is, oh well, they're just really barbaric people. They're quite quite backwards, so they like to fight, and that's why some of them, whenever they lose, they have to come up here because ISIS is down there, and ISIS is one of them, of course, uh, and now they have to move. But even if we look at, let's, let's look at all the, the barbarism that 
ISIS has unleashed on the Middle East, which is quite a lot, how many people would they have killed if we, if we are realistic about it? Let's say 100,000 people. But the US and, and, and Western occupation of Iraq alone killed 1.3 million people. Now, is that barbarism? What's, what, that's not, ISIS is nothing compared to the barbarism that, US, that the US occupation of Iraq actually caused. Not only that, 3.5 million people were internally displaced just because of the war. That was because, before all of these things, these things uh, started taking place. They bombed the infrastructure, the electricity grid, the, 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 the water uh, grid, everything. And they caused a situation, an unbearable situation, where millions of, uh, of Iraqi people have to live in, uh, in, in, uncivilized, uh, in an uncivilized manner with no hopes for the future, with nothing to look forward to, just basically living to survive and, and surviving just to die. That's, that's literally how it is for millions of Iraqi people. And, and as if that wasn't enough, they resorted to extreme sectarian politics, dividing Iraq on, on sectarian lines. There was no sectarianism in Iraq. There's no Al-Qaeda in Iraq. There's not, none of this barbarism that we see in Iraq. It's not because we defend Saddam Hussein, but none of this was there before the US occupation started. But, and they started it in order to dominate the, the country, in order to, to clamp down and to fight the insurgency and, and the mass movements which was developing inside Iraq. And the result is what we see. The result is ISIS and this barbaric, these atrocities that we see every uh, single day. In Afghanistan, they killed 300,000 people, and they continue to do so. In Yemen, actually, right now, 20 million people are on the verge of starvation, or if, not, if they are not already starving. It's the poorest country of the Arab world. It's one of the uh, poorest countries in terms of water in the whole world. Uh, extreme, extreme poverty. And what are they doing? Western imperialism, uh, cooperating with the Gulf allies, Saudi Arabia, and so on, have besieged this country for six months, and they're bombing it every single day. Thousands of people are being killed. Everything has been destroyed. Hospitals, roads, schools, Nothing is, nothing is working. It's difficult to get water. It's difficult to get flour. And that's the situation, that's the situation that these people are creating in the Middle East and also elsewhere. elsewhere. Then there's a, the, the, there's a question of Syria. You know, they say, oh, uh, there's a revolution in Syria. And in fact, funny thing is, up until a few years ago, as long as ISIS was only decapitating people inside Syria, they were freedom fighters. It was, they were praised. They still praise the other extremists, Al-Qaeda and all these people, who are still there, supported by the US, supported by the West. And they were created by these guys. Why? Because they saw an opportunity. As soon as the revolution has started, they saw an opportunity to hijack it by pumping in billions of dollars into the most reactionary groups, hijacking the revolution, and use it for their own purposes, which was you know, the narrow-minded purpose of just overthrowing Assad to get their own uh, uh, um, to get their own people inside. Again, this doesn't mean that we support Assad. Of course, he's a, he's a dictator. But, uh, but uh, that has nothing to do with the war that, that Western imperialism and Western powers started in, in, in inside Syria, and, they, and that they still keep funding today. You see, not, no one really knows this, or no one really hears about this that often, but the Syrian operation is the biggest single uh, uh, post on the CIA's budget. Billions of dollars have been spent by the CIA in Syria. For what? what who have they been supporting? Is there, there's no FSA, there's no Free Syrian Army, revolutionary troops, and so on. If anything, they're just tiny pockets inside big uh, extremist Islamist uh, organizations. Jabhat al-Nusra, uh, which is a part of Al-Qaeda, and Ahrar al-Sham, which is very close to Al-Qaeda. Now, they've been portrayed in New York Times and in other Western mass media as, as these moderate fighters. Moderate, like moderate from what? They're less Islamic, they're less, less barbaric, they cut less throats, which is really not what they're doing. It's still continuing this push towards barbarism and sectarianism, be, be, only because of their own narrow-minded interests. And that is what's causing the situation uh, in, in, in the Middle East. Um, sorry, one second. And in fact, this, I, this question of, of Islamic fundamentalism, you know, they. They scream about, oh, these jihadists are coming and, you know, the, oh, this wave, the, some of these people who are coming up are jihadists. Some of them are Islamists. But who created the Islamists? I don't know if any of you guys uh, 
are old enough to remember Rambo. It was an action film in, in, in the 90s. And it, was, it, was, it was quite entertaining to watch. There's one man army defeating the Soviet army. Inside Afghanistan, who was he fighting with? Who is that film? Rambo 3, which is like one of the biggest like, blockbusters are coming out of Hollywood, was dedicated to the Mujahideen, which is the Taliban, which is the precursors of the Taliban. Because they, they funded them and they built them in order to fight the Soviet, the Soviet uh, influence inside uh, Afghanistan. Just like they funded groups to, 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 uh, to, to serve their own purposes inside Iraq and inside Syria. Of course, now they run out of control, so they have to kind of clamp down on them. But, but all the money and all the funds and resources which came to build up these groups came directly from the pockets of Western imperialism and their allies the Saudi allies and, uh, and other ruthless regimes in, in, the, in the Middle East. The, the Erdogan regime, which is now uh, apparently being welcomed into the EU, uh, who's been supporting ISIS uh, for, for, for several years, for one, and so on. These people are the people who created this mess. These people are the people, they bomb people, they kill people, murder and rape people, and then they complain when they, when they try to, to uh, run for cover, basically. That is the hypocrisy that we need to um, that we need to expose. Now, another question is this question of economic refugees. Oh, there's a difference because if you have a gun to your head, there's a difference than to be than, than to live a life in, in in poverty, which is absolute nonsense. Because poverty and misery is the daily day violence that capitalism exerts on every, on people throughout the world. Twenty-two thousand kids die every single day. That's eight million people. Eight million ch children die every single year because of starvation, because of easily curable diseases. Now, that, that's more than the Holocaust, every single year. Now, these people cry over the Holocaust, but what about this? Who's created this situation? Is it these people's fa own faults that, they, that, they're, that they've ended up in, in, in poverty? I would say absolutely not. They've been subjugated and they've been exploited. Uh, by, by capitalism, uh, and this is the result. Uh, and of course, if they try to go to a place where they at least have some chance of a de decent future, some hope that they can become something else than just a, a walking corpse, then why not? That is just, as, just the same as, 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 as fleeing from bombs and, 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 and shots and so on. So this is, this is really the, the, this, the situation. Now, of course, there's also another element of this, in that there is a real crisis, there is a real refugee crisis, but it's not our crisis, it's not the crisis of working people and normal working, working class youth and so on. That's not our problem, it's the crisis of capitalism, and, it's, and especially, first and foremost, it's the crisis of, of the European capitalism. Because the thing is that this, this thing has completely, uh, how do you say, uh, exposed the tensions which, are, which lie beneath the, um, the, the, the European Union, because obviously economically it would not be a, a difficult thing to absorb these people who are coming here. But the point is that the first place they enter are normally the peripheral states, which is Italy, Greece, and, and Eastern European countries, which are most heavily indebted and hit by the general crisis of capitalism. But of course these people are saying, well, we can't take we can't take all the, 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 burden, the whole burden of, of, of these people. It's for, for um, taking care of them and, and in, in, in absorbing them into our workforce. Um, so you have to take them. Of course, the Euro, then the Central European countries, Greece and France, sorry, Germany and France and Britain and so on. They say, no, 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 this is an agreement we have. This is basically the laws of, uh, this is the laws that we've written down, the Belfast Agreement, uh, I believe it's called, that says that the refugees coming into EU have to get asylum or be, be, um, uh, their cases have to be looked at in the first country that they step into. So what happens is that these countries basically let people go through them, and then the other countries start taking measures such as setting up border patrols and these kinds of things, which is completely against the whole fundamental idea of the EU. is actually undermining the EU because the main thing that the EU has is, is a free movement of labor. That's basically what it has. To use cheap labor from, from, from poor countries to undermine the more expensive labor of the uh, work, work, working classes of, of, the, of the more advanced countries of the EU. Now, but setting up border patrols and, and, and these kinds of protectionist measures 
is undermining the whole idea of the EU, and it's um, and it's adding to the general instability that we see. It's also adding to the general instability inside the um, the, the, the different uh, nations. Now, just one thing about this whole thing is that Merkel and Angela Merkel, who's the um, Chancellor of, of Germany has, uh, has apparently been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize because she accepted so many people coming in. Now there are two sides of this because first of all the German capitalist class, a part of them, especially the industrial part of them, they actually don't mind uh, refugees that much, especially people from Syria which are normally very highly educated which they need to basically incorporate into their own workforce to have basically as cheap labor into the uh, German industry, which is, which is what, what, what they need. Uh, and at the same time, they also have an interest in not letting the EU uh, walk into a crisis. So that's one part of the reason why Angela Merkel has accepted certain amount of, of, uh, uh, of refugees. But the other thing is that it's absolutely hypocritical, because at the same time, she's been putting pressure on the fascist thug ruling uh, Hungary, Viktor Orban, to crack down, in, you know, killing and brutally cracking down on, on these refugees. She went to Turkey last week to make a deal with Erdogan, another aspiring fascist, let's put it like that, at least an aspiring dictator, to make a deal for Erdogan basically to stop uh, Syrian refugees from, from going uh, through uh, Turkey. So of course, while she can come up and smile and say, oh yeah, we'll take a couple of hundred thousand refugees, then she's stabbing them in the back uh, f from behind um, by going and, and forcing other regimes basically, other, other governments to do the dirty work um, for her. So there's absolutely no reason to think that she's somehow better than the, than the rest of the ruling class. Um, now another element in this whole uh, issue is that over the past few decades there has been a, a gradual crisis of bourgeois democracy. If you look at all the traditional uh, ruling parties in, in, in Europe and in the West, they've all been undermined dramatically because of the uh, austerity politics that they've been carrying out and because of the general decay, because of the continuous attacks that they've been doing. And this is not just the social democracies and organizations which were seen as a part of the, uh, the working class movement, but also the, the right wing, the conservative, the liberal organizations. There's been a gradual decline in them and, and, and corrosion, if, if, if you may. They've lost the appeal. How many, how, 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 how can, uh, for instance, the Tory party instill some kind of enthusiasm amongst large layers of the masses. For instance, in the 30s, who would they have as, as a mass base? They would have doctors and teachers, this layer of people, this layer of middle class people who were somehow privileged and, and had a better living standard, had a be better jobs and, and so on. But look at the doctors today. Look at the teachers today. They're at the forefront of the class struggle because they're being attacked relatively, you may say, because, you know, in relation to their previous position. They're being attacked the hardest. So these organizations don't have any real mass space anymore. They don't have real mass appeal. And in that vacuum, you've seen the, the, the rise of these right-wing movements, these right-wing populist nationalist movements such as UKIP, such as um, the Sweden Democrats in Sweden, Front National in France, Danish People's Party in Denmark, who basically use this dissatisfaction, which is coming from, from below, but pointing to another direction, saying, oh yeah, the reason why your, your conditions are being undermined, the reason why your life is, life living standards are falling, is because of the immigrants. Everything is because of the immigrants. They're stealing your benefits, they steal, you know, they're just sucking, they're just parasites on the state. Of course, then they forget to say that the biggest parasites on the state are, are the ruling class, receive you know, billions of, of direct and indirect subsidies every single year, who hustle and steal tax, you know, the, uh, taxpayers' money, and never get arrested, never get fined, uh, like this uh, HSBC scandal where they had 100 billion pounds worth of, of, of tax evasion. And how many people have been arrested? One, I think, out of the thousand people who participated in this whole thing. Now imagine some immigrant going cheating for you know, 200 pounds uh, uh, of worth of benefits just to make things uh, run at home. Uh, he'll be uh, sanctioned and put to jail and, and whatnot and be on the front page of every single paper. But forget about that. The, the main thing is that these uh, organizations have, have tried to di divert the attention of a layer of the working class, divide the working class basically, in order for the ruling class uh, to rule. Now, 
that has, has been allowed to happen mainly because there hasn't been any alternative from the left. The labor leaders, the, the leaders of the unions, the leaders of the social democracies, the left-wing organizations, the labor parties, and so on, have not said anything to this, to this whole movement. They haven't, they haven't opened their mouths. In fact, they've gone along. There's been this kind of, uh, kind of competition of who can be the most rabid right-wing, who can be the most racist, who can be the most uh, uh, vicious, who can perform the most vicious attacks on immigrants and be like the most intelligent in only hitting immigrants and not uh, uh, Western people without saying so outright. Although it is so easy to take down these people. I mean, the, the whole logic that these people apply, the whole logic that these right-wing nationalists apply, is so easy to tear down. You just take, let's say you take UKIP, you just take the program and you just read it out loud. What does it say? It's not a, it's not a question of defense of the working class. It's privatizations. Is attacks, is low, lower working, uh, lower uh, uh, wages, and it's just an onslaught after onslaught against the working class. Why isn't it that these labor leaders have not uh, been out there trying to expose these these movements? Uh, it's basically because they've given up any kind of struggle against the system. But nevertheless, underneath the surface, amongst thousands of young people and working class people who instinctively see this is the thing that we as Marxists understand. That, that the working masses don't have any nation. Work, the working class is instinctively internationalist. Of course, if you take any worker or young people, young person from, from, from London, and you go to, say, Egypt, you have far more in common with an Egyptian uh, youth or Egyptian worker than you would have with, the, with any member of the ruling class uh, 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 of this nation, and vice versa. The ruling class, although they might have their differences culturally, but they have far more, uh, the, sorry, the, the working class have far more in common internationally than they have against each other. In fact, nationalism and racism is, is, the, is the policy, is the ideology of the ruling class. They have something to defend. They have their own turfs, their own markets to defend. The workers have, not, have, have no interest in uh, 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 nationalism, in fact. And that's been shown in this, by this whole crisis because this has brought out those underlying tensions and frustrations of people constantly for years waiting for someone to give a lead, someone to say, let's do something, someone to organize a movement against this whole uh, rabid right-wing uh, uh, binge, racist binge of the establishment. And people are just fed up. So they've, they've taken things into their own hands. And that's where you saw hundreds of thousands of people taking to the streets, uh, sporadically, like, spontaneously, basically. So in, in Sweden, you had tens of thousands of people in several cities. In Denmark, I know that some five people, just five friends, just set up a, a Facebook group, called a demonstration, and 50,000 people came out. The same thing happened in Austria. 30,000 people came out to welcome these trains of refugees who were coming out. In London, you had 100,000 people. People were organizing across borders, driving to the borders of, of Eastern Europe and wherever these refugees were coming, to drive people up into other countries, such as France, Germany, Spain, and so on. Basically, taking direct action, disobeying the laws of the capitalist system, disobeying the laws of the state and the orders of the state in order to help their class brothers and sisters who they could see were in, in, in need of help. And that, if you can say, is a, is a part of the same movement which we see everywhere in Europe, this kind of anti-establishment movement, which kind of uh, rejects everything that the establishment says. And I, I think that what all these hundreds of thousands of young, young and old people have done really shows what the labor leaders should have done. They show who, how they should have clarified the class positions. Who is, who is a, a, an internationalist? Is, is us. And who are the racists? It's the ruling class. But the, of course, they didn't really um, do this. So, one second, sorry. Um, Yes. So I would also say that this is a part of the same anti-establishment anti mood that we see everywhere, which is also beginning to get a political expression someplace. For instance, in Greece, you saw the development of Syriza, which was kind of an outside. How much have I asked? Ten, ten, ten minutes left. Yeah. Okay. So in Greece, you saw the, the development of Syriza, which is, uh, well, which is now a different chapter now. But the, the initial development of it was an outside force not a part of the establishment organizations, 
which had radical speech, and people, people went for it in order to use it as a tool to change society. In Spain, you've seen the rise of Podemos, uh, and in Britain, you've seen the rise, on the one hand, you saw, you saw the movement in Scotland, uh, which was clearly a working class movement, and also you see in, in the rest of Britain the rise of Jeremy Corbyn uh, as another expression of this movement which is developing from below, of people who are, who are fed up with the, uh, the hypocrisy, the lies, and the rottenness of the establishment, basically, and who are taking matters into their own hands and who are enter entering political life. And that is, if you may, that is, in fact, the, the initial steps of a revolutionary movement. People saying, we're not going to trust the professional politicians. We're not, we're not going to trust the official bureaucrats and the people walking in the corridors and making deals. We're actually going to take things in our own hands. It's the first steps of the awakening of the European uh, uh, working class of, on a revolutionary course, I may say. And this question of the refugees is, is a part of the same, uh, same movement. Now, <clears throat> On, on a more general scale, if we look at the, uh, the world today, of course, this thing shouldn't be really a problem. This, this question of, of, of refugees shouldn't be a problem. In Europe, you have, for instance, 11 million empty homes. Why can't you house people in that? You have 20 to 30% overcapacity in industries, in different industries, where you can incorporate people as workers, also not just refugees coming up, but also unemployed people from Europe. But the point is that this question of, of, of refugees and, and migration is actually a part of the capitalist system. It's a, it's a system, in fact, which is it's the only system ever in human history which has created a situation where you have too many things. Because you have too much, too much capacity in the factories, you have too much production, you lay off people, you cause misery, you have to attack. And the whole, the whole situation that we're seeing today with the development of um, with, with the rise of, uh, of um, refugees and internally displaced people, whatever you call them technically, it's all the same, is a part of the same thing. It's a part of the, the, the crisis of capitalism in a situation of crisis. Karl Marx explained this in the Communist Manifesto, it's 160 years ago, but it's absolutely right today. That in a situ situation of crisis, the capitalists have two choices. One is to exploit their own working classes even harder, which is what we see, which is actually a part of these things come from that, from land grabs and, and uh, you know, displacements inside uh, uh, the countries, such as India and Ethiopia and so on. And also the other element is to, uh, to uh, basically go for a hunt for, for, for new markets, to, to attack other countries, other nations. And again, this is the other, the other element of this whole uh, 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 thing. You have a system where all the prerequisites exist for solving all the problems of humanity. With the technology, with the production capacity we have today, you can, you can solve all these problems of poverty, unemployment, housing, I, mean, I, I can go on. But nevertheless, it doesn't work because the tiny, rotten minority sit on, sit, who's sitting on, on, the, on the ownership of these things do not have an interest in using them for the, uh, for, for the benefit of the masses of society, and in fact, of society, society as a whole. These people, they're willing to drag down humanity into barbarism. They, they're willing to, to completely destroy the foundation of civilization in order to defend their own privileges. That's exactly why we're seeing it, in, especially in the Middle East, it's absolutely clear. Why is Erdogan supporting ISIS, and why is, why is he supporting ISIS and Al-Qaeda and all these people? On the one hand, he, he wants to be a new sultan, he wants to create a new Ottoman Empire, but at the same time, he wants to divert attention from the class struggle brewing inside, uh, inside Turkey itself. The Saudi Arabia, the, the, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia is the same. This rotten, this rotten system, this horrible system of these, these disgusting people, these princes and princelings who think they can do whatever they want to do. Why is it that, why is it that they keep funding uh, uh, Islamic fundamentalism and so on? Is it, for one, is to defeat revolutionary movements throughout, uh, throughout the Middle East but it's also to divert attention from the situation which is, which is brewing inside Saudi Arabia itself, which is, which is explosive, in fact, and could destroy the, the nation uh, itself. So throughout the world, we see that this situation that the ruling class is in a crisis, and, and the way that it's trying to get, it tries to get out of this uh, is basically by destroying the, um, 
the conditions for millions of people. Um, in the West, of course, they preach democracy, but that doesn't change anything. I mean, these people murder, rob, bomb, kill, rape, do whatever they want to do, and not just in the Middle East, and, and, they, and they produce absolutely nothing. They can, they're parasites in reality. I mean, they might have suits and speak very well and eat without uh, spilling on their clothes. But the fact that they're, they're just criminals, they're just thugs, like any other street thug that you could, you, could, you could pick up. Look at the mess that they created in half of the world. And they're willing to do uh, 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 much more. Now, that is capitalism. The thing is, for us it's not a question of, it's not an accidental thing. That's the most important thing for us to understand. This is not an accidental thing. It's not just a terrible thing which is happening. It's a general trend within capitalism. And as the crisis of capitalism increases, so will this trend, so will the destruction and horrors that it, that it creates. Capitalism is, Lenin said it 100 years ago, is horror without end. And that's literally true as we see it today. There's no way out of this within the, this system. Now, of course, the mask, you know, the smiling mask of democracy, of course, is also falling off by the day. Uh, and, and that's, for us, it's not a bad thing. Because we're not, here, you know, we're not here to be sentimental about this. Of course, it's terrible what's going on, people being displaced and losing everything. But that's always happened. But now it's coming to the fore. Now everyone can see it, and people are actually starting to fight back. And that's the most important thing. So we're not here asking you for charity or you know, give some money to some NGO, which will then go off and build some, t uh, some, some tents. Because that's not going to solve anything. In fact, it's going to make things worse, because you're going to divert people it's going to divert the attention from what's, what's really important, which is to fight this system. That's the only way you can over, over, overcome these things. Of course, it doesn't mean to, to, under, to undermine what, you know, the solidarity that people are showing and the things that people are doing, which is extremely important and extremely important. But it must be connected to the fight against this, uh, against this, uh, this system. That's the only way you can uproot and you can change this situation. Now everywhere you see that people are rising, people are rising against these things. The, the, the refugee crisis is one aspect of it, but the capitalists are, are, are attacking everywhere. They're going to they're gonna cut, um, I mean in Britain alone they're cutting everything that, every, that people took for granted. You want free education? It's gone. It's nowhere near. near it's, no, it's not going to be able, probably it's not going to be available for most of your kids. I know for my kid it's not going to be available. Unless we take power, then it's a different, <laughs> different situation. In, in, uh, the NHS used to be a world-class uh, world healthcare system. What is it now? It's a death trap for many people. Not because of the doctors and nurses who are running around like mad people trying to make things work, because it's not enough for them. Because it's, the situations which are created for them are impossible. And all of these things, all of these horrors, horrors and, 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 and barbarism that we see today is going to push more and more people to go out and fight against the struggle. And we ask you to join us in that struggle, not, not just pushed by events, but consciously. Try to study, study the underlying reasons for it and, and go into it prepared so we can take it to its logical conclusion as soon as possible without uh, that many um, say, sacrifices. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, just so, uh, I think uh, Nicholas talked about the question of Germany and, and cheap labor and so on. You know, this, the truth is many-sided in, in many ways. The capitalist class has different layers and different groups which have different interests. I think also there's a layer of, uh, of the capitalists, of kind of the old gang, who are, are very, uh, how to say, concerned about the instability which is coming, and the fact that they can't control even the right wing. You see, the nationalists, the, 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 the bourgeois nationalists, are also a threat to some of the old bourgeois politicians and so on. And the in, like, su sudden implementation of a big group of, uh, of foreigners in a situation where unemployment might be rising plays into that. So there's lots of things going on there, which is also just the internal, how do you say, infighting of, of the bourgeois uh, and the capitalists <coughs> with each other. Uh, now, they will take advantage of any given situation to undermine the position of the working class and, and strengthen their own position, whether there's refugees inside or, or, or outside. 
that's that's I think the the, the only way you can you can understand these things and, and to understand that th there are different interests at stake here. Um, but th this question of uh, of intervention in Syria and, and so on, like what can we do now? I think that is a very that is a sense that everyone has. Like a lot of young people have that sense that we must do something now. People are dying, not just one or two people. Millions of people are dying. Millions of people don't have anything to live for anymore, even if even if they're not dead, because everything is destroyed. But how can you change that? I, I think it's it's uh, it's not the solution to say we should do more of what we have done, just a bit stronger. You know, it's like saying. Oh, this guy is stabbed and he's going to die in an hour. You should have just cut his head off immediately. That's not going to solve anything. Uh, the question of intervention, direct imperialist imp intervention in Libya, as Adam explained, that was a direct in imperialist intervention. What did that lead to? What would it, what would it lead to if, this, if you say US and, and the UK sent uh, troops and invaded Syria? What would, that, what, would, what would that make? Would it be better than 1.3 million people killed in Iraq? Or would it be worse? When you look at Iraq, that was exactly what they did, wasn't it? They invaded the country in order to overthrow a, a, a dictator. So in Syria, they've done it more clumsily. We can accept that because they're their own weakness. Yeah? But what's, what's the difference? What's, what's the result in Iraq and what's the result in Syria? Iraq is not better off than Syria. Most of Iraq is, is, is decaying and decomposing and falling apart as we speak. That's, that's not the solution. And in fact, I think... Uh, it's a, it's a imperialist would never have a how do you say would never have an interest in developing a country like Syria. Why would they do that? They only go there to, to pillage. So the fact of saying you should just go in even harder, you should go in even more forcefully, even more brutally, bombing even more and sending ground to to to, to hold down people, that's not going to make the situation for the Syrian working class any better. Um, in, and in fact, they have been intervening quite dramatically. And the, f and the people who they were supporting now, those are the same people they would support if they had invaded the country. Who would have taken over if they overthrew Assad? It would have been the same groups. They, they were there from before. They would just become stronger by the civil war. Who else, or what else, what would be the, a better situation in Syria? It would be a, a, a massive sectarian infight, even worse than, than what we see now probably. And people would rise up to fight against U.S. Uh, imperialism, or Western imperialism, and they would have been uh, they they would try to crush them. It wouldn't just be oh let's go just remove Assad and then have a democratic election because they don't care about democratic elections, um, as we as we have seen uh, elsewhere. I don't think that it has. There's literally no there's an example in world history of Western imperialism invading a country and something good coming out of it. Which, which country has, has that happened to? It's never happened. Really? Viet Vietnam is not a you know, shining example to put forward. As I said, Libya and Iraq and so on. Somalia, what's, what's the situation in Somalia? It's falling apart. In, in Yemen, they're quite forceful. I mean, you couldn't be more forceful than you are in Yemen, besieging the whole country, bombing it every single day. They have troops inside. But what's the situation in Yemen? Uh, three or four hundred thousand people are internally displaced. They can't even get out. They can't even go to Europe because every all borders are closed off, uh, and even more people are dying inside. So the the question of having an even stronger in intervention by imperialism, by Western imperialism, uh, will not solve anything. And I think that's the whole the whole thing we have to explain is that this situation, the the, the uh, question of uh, immigration and refugee and so on, would not be a problem in a socialist society. Why would people even flee? Why would hundreds of thousands of people suddenly decide to, 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 to leave a country, unless it was some extreme natural disaster? But when, if, if there were all, if all the resources and so on, which existed in, in any given country, and especially in the Middle East, which is full of resources, human and natural, if it was all used to develop society, to raise cultural level, to lay, raise living standards, then why would people flee? And if, even if they had to, let's say you come to, to Europe, what would, in a socialist Europe, where the commanding heights of the economy would be nationalized under workers' control, what would happen if you had one million more people coming in, 10 million more people coming in? You would just put them into production and then lower working hours for everyone, or you would just produce more things. But that's, that's the thing, in capitalism, that can't be done. It can't be done in a, in a capitalist system because of this question that the means of production are owned by individuals. 
uh, not socially owned or controlled, uh, democratically controlled. Uh, and I think that's really the, the, the lesson, this, this idea that yes, we must do something, but we must do something that works. And in fact, I would say that uh, arguing for having you know, more imperialist interventions or arguing for just uh, only, I mean, the only charitable help is not going to solve the situation. This is, is an excellent thing. It shows the revolutionary nature and the and international nature of the people that they're doing it, but it's not going to solve the question. It's not going to solve the problem. It's not going to end the battle. It's not going to end the struggle for better living standards. This is what basically it boils down to, is living standards. There's living standards which, which are being shattered either by economic bombs and, and weapons or by, by, by conventional military uh, arms, and, arms and weapons. And the only way you can you can, you can solve that is the system which creates this. Capitalism as a system is a, is a system which requires wars. Because every time a, a, a certain ruling class has exhausted its own internal market, the only way it can, it can continue to grow and defend its privileges and profits is by expanding. So naturally there are divisions and tensions rising up between different nations in a capitalist society. Uh, uh, basically, in the end, in the final analysis, a struggle for markets. And that's what creates wars and instability, uh, especially in a situation of crisis, which is why we see an increase in wars and instability. Um, so the only way of, of, of solving the, the, the solution, I think we need to be honest and we need to, how do you say, <laughs> you know, by giving a half a, some, you know, a um, attractive, easy solution, you, you're diverting not you, but you as a, <laughs> a person, is diverting attention from the real struggle, which is against the system. And we have to say things boldly. Only by overthrowing the system can this, can this uh, situation be solved. Even if tomorrow every single working class European says, okay, I'm gonna give half of my next month's wages and I'm gonna take in every single refugee, all the borders are open. It's still the same instability and so on will continue because of the inherent contradictions of the system from the next day from the following day, and you're going to see new things arriving. It's, al it's also not just in the Middle East. You have all over Africa, where imperialists have been plundering and stealing for, for decades, you have, you have people uh, coming from there as well. The Congo, which is extremely rich in minerals, has, has been a stage of imperialist infighting for years and years, and Congo is one of the main countries that these people are coming from. In India, you have millions of uh, refugees, but they're just internal, so they don't count in, in the conventional statistics. Why? Because big companies are coming in and peasants are being uh, removed for forcefully in order to, to create the best conditions for these, these companies. And when they fight, they get, they get gunned down and they get killed and butchered, but we, but we never hear about it. The same situation we, we hear, we, we, we see in, in the Middle East is a different, uh, with different severity, with maybe less severe, maybe less acute at this stage, happens everywhere and, and we're not going to solve it. Uh, there's no halfway solution to this. Uh, and that's, I think, the, the, the main lesson that we, that we have to take. The only way is to take power away from that tiny minority of unproductive, parasitic people who have no interest in developing society and giving power, putting power in the hands of normal, uh, normal people who are the only ones who have any interest in developing society, culture, living standards, and so on. Uh, thank you very much.